introduce myself. I, my name is Ashley Hogan Pierce. This is my child that's going to go this direction and sit down. Um, and I am just an individual agent here in Central Kentucky. Um, I've been doing real estate since 2014 and um, started out with a small mom and pop company and um, decided that I wanted to do bigger and better things. I came to KW in 2018, I believe, and I've been here ever since. So um, that is a little bit about my story. And I am, like I said, I don't think I've ever taught a class like this before. So bear with me. If you can't see me or if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll try to fix it. So today um, we are going to be uh, kind of talking about, this is class 19 of the Ignite program for Kelly Williams. And um, we're gonna be talking about a uh, contract to close. So I'm gonna pull the slideshow up here and get that um, going for you. If you guys have any questions, um, I think you I mean, you might be able to unmute yourself or raise your hand. I think it'll pop up or something for me to be able to see that. Let me see if I can make you guys. Oh, no, let's undo that. Yeah, that's better. Well, okay, I messed it up. Okay, that works. Sorry. Okay, get to the close. And... Okay. All right. So um, this is just a little quote from Gary Keller. And uh, I, I don't know how long a lot of you guys have been in real estate. Some of you may have been in real estate for a while and, um, you know, you're just kind of wanting to refresh or, you know, maybe reboost yourself because I know how that can be. It can get exhausting and then you kind of just fall off and you need something to help motivate you. Um, and then a lot of you may also be new agents as well. But I always tell everybody the the funnest and best part of real estate is showing the properties and meeting people, you know, doing the client events, doing all the fun stuff. But when you get down to the beans and the potatoes, that's your, when you get it under contract, that's when you really got to work. And um, I tell a lot of people that part of it is a lot like problem solving. Um, it's really where a lot of your time goes to, and you got to keep that contract together from the moment that you sign it to the moment that they get the keys and everybody's happy and live in their new home. So um, it says real estate transactions aren't particularly trouble free. It's a strenuous and trying time that requires all the attention effort you can command. And that is so true. Um, a lot of people think of us and they think, oh, they have so much fun. They just show houses. And yeah, that's a blast. But we really do a lot more work than people think that we do. And especially once we get it under contract. Oh, what am I doing? I click something. Okay. Go back. Am I going the right way? Um, hang on. Okay. I'm going to use that button instead. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So this is just kind of just showing a little timeline here. Um, sort of how this whole sec session is going to go. And um, let's go on past that. So as a real estate agent, it is important to keep track of the deadlines and the contract. That is so true. So, um, you know, one thing that I do is I have what I call my congrats letter. So um, I don't know if I have a copy of that. I'm, I may have a copy of that in my email that I can I can pull up and show you guys. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Maybe I am. But basically, once once my buyer gets under contract, um, I have a letter that I send out to them through email that includes their contract. It includes you know their seller's disclosure, anything necessary. It also it has my um, inspector list on it. Um, that way. Once they're under contract, of course, now they're thinking about getting that inspection done. So I send them that, that includes um, their inspection deadline, how to get their earnest money to me, and as well as when we need to close by according to that contract. And I highlight all those deadlines in red. And um, I try to mark those in my calendar as well. That way I know myself and I can keep up with it. But um, ultimately, you know, it's also important for the client to know, not just you, because they might not understand the importance of getting, getting that inspection scheduled and how much time that they have to do that. So, um, so she used the contract you've been using for previous days. Okay. Let's go on through here. 
All right, so here's a little timeline from contract acceptance to closing. And they have that contract acceptance um, September 9th. Inspection period would end September 13th and closing by October the 10th. So that's a general timeline. Of course, in the last year or so, that's been a little bit different because we've that closing date has been extended beyond 30 days, you know, and it's been extended to 45 and 60 days. And I think, um, you know, that could that could vary based on whether it's a cash transaction. It can vary based on whether it's a VA loan or just other contingencies of that uh, contract that you have. Um, looks like they have a 11, about a 10 or 11 day inspection period. That's pretty common. Um, my area is very rural, so there's not a whole lot of inspectors there. And sometimes, you know, if they hire one from Louisville or somewhere up north to come down to me, it's gonna take more like 15 days for that. So, um, 10 to 15 days is a real common inspection period. So contract acceptance, our first deadline contract date is that inspection period. That means inspections, any inspections that they're doing that's not gonna be um, needed for their loan, that's not gonna be protected by the loan, it needs to be done by that date. Um, and that includes you sending them that um, repair request for that termination if that's what you decide to do. Sorry, it may be a little entertaining. I'm hoping my child will stay over here in the chair, but he thinks it's hilarious that he's on TV. So <laughs> I'm gonna apologize. Um, this is so true. And I, you know, some of you all may be on teams, some of you may be individual agents. And if you're on a team, this contract to close is gonna look probably quite a bit different for you than it does for just a, sorry, let some money in, just a, an, um, an agent that works on their own as, you know, just the independent agent. So it says the transaction touches many hands before it is complete. It's not just handled by you, your client, and the co-op agent. Um, so, you know, one thing with that is, you know, it's going to touch the lender's hands. It's going to touch the underwriter's hands. It's going to touch the appraiser's hands. Unfortunately, they know exactly what, you know, somebody's given for the home when they go to appraise it. So, um, it's important that your contract is clear that, you know, everything on it is legible. If it's going to be a messy contract, a lot of times I will go back and I'll redo it again because I like to make sure my contract is bulletproof um, and that they're not going to be sending it back to me, you know, wanting me to fix something. So just keep that in mind too. I don't know if I'm supposed to, do, am I supposed to do all these little things? Work in a small group or with a partner or? Okay, we're skipping it. All right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, what is the first, okay, this is just something to think about. This is if you are working, this mouse isn't working and now these people are over here. Um, I don't, I'm not an Apple person. <laughs> Hang on, try to go back. Um, okay, so it looks like these are just some questions to maybe ask yourself, like what's the first thing my buyer needs? What do the buyers need to know and do? What do I need to know and do? And what does the rest of the team, agents, lenders, et cetera, need to know, take action on and when? Um, what am I doing at each point to bulletproof, there's no word, bulletproof, the transaction and set myself and my buyers up for a successful closing? Um, I've been doing this a while. So, you know, I'm real bad about writing stuff down and having all that in front of me and little bullets and stuff, but you know, that's sort of where my congrats letter comes in. Um, I like to spell all of that out in that letter from, you know, congratulating them on their contract, letting them know how soon and where to send their earnest money, take a photo of that. If, you know, if they can't get it to me in person, take a photo before they mail it. Um, and then letting them know those, those dates, those deadlines, who, you know, at least three inspectors in the area, that way they can get um, their home inspected. Let them know also that they, you know, it's not just a home inspection. They can have a septic inspection, um, termite inspection, radon inspection, any kind of inspection that they want to have done, they can do that. Um, and I try to, in that letter, also spell out um, and give them the contact information and all that for those, for those people. That way they have it handy. Um, 
Um, they need to know also what I'm going to do after this point. So um, I'm going to send that contract to their lender and it, it's their responsibility or, you know, it might be a little bit different as I know everybody works differently, but I leave it on my buyer to schedule their inspections. Um, I don't want to be responsible if somebody comes back and misses something. So I leave that on them. They can schedule it. They know their time frame and when they can do stuff and I don't. So it's just easier just to let them handle that. Um, and then I don't have to be the middle person making sure that everybody's schedules line up. Um, that and then I just kind of spell out the whole um, timeline of events for them from okay to your it's going to your lender. This is now time for your initial underwriting. We're going to get your inspections done. This is our deadline. Um, after that, you know they're going they're going to schedule the appraisal. Your lender is going to do that. Once that appraisal is done, it's going to go back into underwriting. We're going to do our walkthrough and we're going to close. So I just try to make sure they understand that timeline of events so they're not constantly asking me, hey, what are we doing next? What do I do next? Um, it just kind of helps the transaction go a little bit smoother. All right. Um, we'll go on past this. You guys are right in front of this. Oh, and here's kind of that little timeline. And this is for a buyer. So it's going to look a little bit different. Can you all see each other on my screen too? Can they see that? <laughs> Me moving them around? Okay, I hope not. I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, there. That's much better. You're on the bottom. Um, so this is the this is the buyer's timeline, which is going to look a whole lot different for a seller. Uh, I mostly work with sellers. I do very few buyers. Probably 20% is is the buyers for me. The rest is all going to be sellers. Um, so. Sometimes when I get a buyer, if I haven't had a buyer for a while, I'm like, oh gosh, this is a lot of work. But <laughs> anyway, this kind of spells out what that timeline looks like for them. Um, so there we are with our contract date of um, September 9th. I'm going to get that inspect inspector list to the buyer. Um, we're going to collect their earnest money. We're going to get that deposited. Make sure that we get a copy of that, put it into command so that it's in there. We're going to uh, inform the listing agent of the inspection. A lot of times now with showing time, the inspectors, you know, they have access to that. So a lot of times they don't even call me and tell me when that's going to be. Um, and then my buyer actually call me and tell me when that's going to be, or I'll see it in an email or something. Um, but that's the next thing that you're going to do. Then you have your inspections. We're going to have probably a few days once all the inspections are done to send our response to that listing agent. Um, that's going to be either in a repair request. It might be a, you know, us renegotiating a price or termination, or we might say, we're all good. Let's move forward. Um, one of those four, but hopefully we're moving forward because the goal is to keep things rolling. But sometimes, you know, well, actually most of the time that's not the case, especially lately. It seems like we've been getting a lot of stuff on our repair request. Um, the next, of course, our appraisal, that's due. Our final walkthrough, then we enclose. So um, that's kind of the breakdown of all of that there. I think I just kind of mentioned it before I even knew it was a slide, but there we go, heard it again. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is for buyers steal. So interaction and communication points. If anybody has a question, please stop me. Or if you think I'm going too fast or you can't understand me, <laughs> sometimes people are like, what did you just say? But um, just let me know. Okay. Common interaction points, communication of the deadlines, you know, however that is. If, if they're not going to check their email and they don't get that, just make sure you're going to text it to them. Um, Make sure that you call them and tell them some people don't text. So I have some clients that don't text and they don't use email. So I have to call them and tell them. Um, communication of the contract to other parties, such as the title and the lending company. Making sure that that contract gets there quickly is going to get you faster to the closing table. Whether that's, you know, if a lot of times um, people will, if they're, you know, using an out-of-state lender. They won't have any idea who to use for the title company. You may have a title company that you use regularly. I try to send everything the same day. Try to get it going. <clears throat> Making sure the lender and the buyer are communicating. 
that has not been such an issue as of recent. When I first started real estate, it seemed like it was sometimes impossible to get a hold of lenders, but now they're more aggressive and they're definitely, you know, doing a lot better job at communicating from what I can tell. So um, making sure that the buyer is doing what they need to do so the lender can get the documents they need, make sure things are moving forward. That's what we are. We're kind of motivating everything. Um, let's see, communication of list or list of recommended title companies, inspectors, and insurance agents. So that is included in my congrats letter. Um, I have, usually I, I, I keep three lenders in there, um, insurance ag agencies, inspection companies, um, title companies, all that is included in there, making sure you're communicating that with them. Scheduling and communication with inspectors and the listing agent. Like I said, um, unless somebody just simply requests me to do it, maybe they're too busy or they have an odd schedule. A lot of times my buyers, I leave it up to them to go ahead and schedule their own inspection. Um, so, okay, sending amendments or inspection reports to other side title. Okay, so let's just say that um, we were in a transaction and that price was negotiated differently. We need to make sure the title company is aware of that. I've had many times that I've received that closing document and we maybe had negotiated a different price and everything on there is from the original price. So just making sure anytime there's an uh, addendum or something or an amendment that all that's uh, negotiated or communicated with the right person. Okay, when I'm reminding the buyers to not make, oh, that's another thing with your buyers. No big purchases. Don't go out and try to, um, don't change your job. <laughs> I have a list actually that I give my buyers that it's, I call it the 10 commandments of buying a home. And really it is, there's 10 things on it. And um, it's, it just kind of spells out all the things thou shall not do while you're buying a home, it's actually kind of, it's, it's really nice. So I, I don't care to share that with you guys if you want to see it, but obviously uh, don't go out and buy a car, don't switch your job, don't, you know, get a new increase to your pay. Um, there's a lot of things on there. I can't remember all of them. Oh, make sure you're not spending a lot on your credit cards, keep them at 15% or less, you're paying those off. No new credit cards, no new credit. Don't co-sign for anybody. Um, so just making sure that they know not to do that. Don't go buy your furniture yet or your appliances. Um, if you're wanting new appliances, make sure you wait till you get the keys in your hand and you can buy whatever you want. doesn't matter at that point. So um, before we're closing, it's a good thing to reach out to the listing agent. Make sure you have a list of all those utility companies um, that they're going to need for the home. That includes electric, water, um, internet, garbage pickup, um, let's see, propane is a big one in our area. We don't just have natural gas here. So who that propane tank is with and if it's leased or if it's owned. I learned that one the hard way one time. We thought one was owned and it was leased and the lady had a mental breakdown. Um, so that's always a good question to ask before you close and then somebody's upset. Um, so a big one here, as far as communicating holidays and things that may delay the process, me, for instance, I have a closing Friday that was going to be funded Monday, but it's Juneteenth. So the banks aren't open and we're not getting funding until Tuesday. So, you know, sometimes it's good to communicate that with your buyers, um, because obviously it's not a closed deal until everything's done. So they technically won't be closing until Tuesday, but, um, you know, make sure people are aware that that normal 30 day mark due to a holiday, maybe Christmas or whatever holidays that you um, celebrate or that are uh, celebrated within the United States, I guess, um, that they're aware that it may take a little bit longer due to banks being closed and things like that. Um, okay, so how do I negotiate the inspection report when I'm communicating this information? I've done it again. Okay, there we go. Um, these, I always tell my buyers, 
I'm, I'm not that agent that's going to make my buyers just throw, just make this huge list of everything on the inspection, say we want it all fixed or walking. I'm not that agent. I always tell them, look for things that are safety issues, things that are going to definitely hurt the home in the next few years, um, that's going to affect the value of the home, things that you just cannot live with. There, I mean, I've had brand new homes that have problems and, you know, that, that actually would have more on the report than even a home that's 20 years old. So I just try to tell everybody, if it's something that's going to affect your health, your, um, you know, the house could burn down or it's going to affect the value of the home, then definitely consider those things like there's, but there's some things that, you know, are just wear and tear and things like that, that aren't necessarily a big deal that could be fixed through regular maintenance. So um, one thing you can do is you can send that repair request. You can ask them to have it fixed by a licensed professional. Anytime we have something fixed, I always put that in there because if not, they're going to get Joe Blow from down the road to come in and nail up a few little pieces of rotten wood and fix your deck or whatever that they're going to do. I mean, when you're a seller, you're going to try to spend as least amount of money as possible to sell your home and move on. So sometimes if I'm working with the buyer, I try to negotiate more of a price reduction or something like that, just simply because if they want, if they can do it themselves, they're probably going to do a better job than that seller does. So a lot of times we'll do that. We um, sometimes people will even get an allowance depending on what type of loan that you're getting. That could go into you know you could get something like that, um, or you could just say we're done. You're not going to fix it. We're done, and you can walk away as long as you're within your time frame. She will help you. Okay. Um, I think I've already answered this question. When do I touch base with a lender, title company, and listing agent? You know, just as soon as. We get the contract. I'm, I'm going to be in communication with them. So, all right. I hope I'm not going too slow. I'm on 19. So, okay. Documentation points. Um, so, something on here that I always ask my people um, what's the best way to communicate with you? And I kind of touched on this earlier, but, you know, I still have clients that do not email, they do not use text messaging. So when I first meet my buyer, we start this transaction process. I ask them, what's the best way for me to communicate with you? Do you need me to meet with you in person to sign everything in a wet signature? Are you okay with DocuSign or electronic signatures? And I still have people that aren't okay with that. They wanna meet with me. They want me to go over everything with them. And that's fine. I mean, I, that's my job. So I try to communicate every document and I'll break, sometimes I break it down too much and they're like, okay, we're good. We just want to move forward. But I try to explain everything to them um, so that they understand and they're not confused when something else pops up later on. And they're like, what's this? I'm like, I told you. Um, okay. What is the plan? Okay. So hopefully whoever you're sending the document to is going to be getting it back to you pretty quickly, but that is not always the case. I've had some that take several days to get back. And yeah, so templates are going to be your lifesaver. My congrats letter is a template. I fill in names. I fill in earnest money amounts. Um, work smarter, not harder. I think Kellyanne says that quite a bit, and um, I've tried to definitely do that in the last, since I've been with KW, I've learned a lot more than when I was with the company I was with before, but um, templates for, you know, pretty much anything that you do, your congrats letter, your follow-up post, you know, post-closing letter, your thank you letters for that, um, have them all saved in a Word document or something, and, or in your email, like, I'll just copy my email, and then I'll just redo it, so that's typically what I do. I don't think there's anything under that. I think this is the same thing that we looked at a while ago. I'm pretty sure it is. I don't see anything else different. Our timeline, we already went over that. Okay. Who all is involved in a transaction? So now we're moving to sellers, which is my strong point. Um, so 
A seller transaction involves more than just you and the seller. There are many people um, you're responsible for bringing into the transaction. It is your responsibility to set high standards and keep them in the conversation loop. Um, okay, it's telling you to work in a small group, but I don't really know if I'm just supposed to sit here and let you do that or what, but we're going to keep going. If you want to work in a small group, I guess you can. Um, later, oh, somebody's trying to get in. Okay, there we go. So, timeline for your sellers. What's the first thing my seller needs? Um, I always try to, you know, working on as listing agent most of the time, make sure that my seller gets a copy of the, the fully, um, I'm, I'm having a brain fart of what word I need to say. But anyway, the contract that is completely signed and ready to go. Okay. And then um, what do they need to know and do? So they're going to have questions. A lot of times I try to get with my seller before we ever get under contract. And I even have a document for them. It says what I expect of my sellers. Um, and that's going to include from contract to close as well. And um, part of that is just explaining the inspection process, um, making sure that they're not there for the inspection because I don't want them to hear things or, you know, get upset if the inspector is saying things that's going to, you know, and it's not good for them to hear all that anyway. So I make sure, you know, pets are up, they're gone. They're going to know that that inspection is going to take two to six hours, depending on the size of the home and that the buyer can be there um, during that time. So a lot of times what they'll do is that they'll be there and the buyer is there and they swap numbers and they're communicating throughout the whole thing, which is a explosion ready to happen. So it's better if the buyers and sellers are not exchanging numbers or becoming friends and, you know, doing things behind your back that you don't know about. So better to keep them away. So that's one thing that I let them know about. I, you know, and I give them the timeline of events as well. Um, I, I always tell my sellers, you know, you can go ahead and start, which whenever they prepare for their photos, they're kind of already doing this, but um, go ahead and pack away small things that you know that you're not going to use every day and things that are just kind of cluttering around. Go ahead and pack it because you're moving, right? Like, go ahead and box it up. We're going to move. Have it ready to go. It just makes the moving process easier. Um, which in today, in today's, you know, the way real estate is today, um, a lot of times the buyers get keys at closing. So, in my little area, when I first got into real estate, they still had that mentality that they got 30 days after closing. They still have that mentality if I don't explain it to them. So um, I try to always ask the sellers before we get under contract, um, how long are you going to need to move? How long are you going to need after closing? A lot of times, like I had one that, you know, I just dealt with that he worked two weeks at a time offshore, came back for two weeks, worked offshore. So, you know, when clo if closing fell in a time that he was gone, then, you know, he didn't want to really pack up everything and move before the appraisal. So uh, we actually negotiated some time into the contract to make sure that that process was easy for him and then it also worked for the buyers. And in that situation, we always, I always have a um, post-closing occupancy agreement that, you know, pretty much, I get it from my board, from, from GLAR, the global board, that will break down kind of the expectations, releases liability on that seller, and, um, you know, there will be like a, an amount they have to pay if they don't get out by a certain time, and all that stuff that makes everything, makes, makes things go smoother. <laughs> um, so, you know, always make sure that you do that. Don't just let them stay and not have one of those because then they think they can stay forever and they can't because it's not theirs anymore. <laughs> um, so if you guys um, don't have one of those and you have a question about maybe what one of those look like, it's um, basically, I don't know if everybody heard me, but it's um, beyond closing if somebody has to stay. So kind of what what that contract needs to look like. And you should have one from your board, hopefully. Um, okay, so 
As far as our end, the listing end for the sellers, it, uh, you know, for inspection, like I said, just making sure your sellers aren't there, making sure pets are up, make sure the attic spaces and everything are going to be cleared so that the inspector can get there. Um, crawl spaces are easy to access. Any clutter along the walls um, is moved that way that it, they don't have to come back out multiple times to have an inspection done. Okay. I think I'm kind of talking about bulletproofing the transaction by explaining everything to the sellers um, before they before it happens. So um, in the last two years, I don't know how long you guys have been agents, but we've definitely seen an increase in value of homes. Uh, I think we're like at 15% or something like that. I think I've seen something this morning about it. But anyway, um, you know, homes I sold two and three years ago, I've sold for quite a bit more in the last, you know, year to six months. Uh, some of them have doubled, like my, my vacation properties have definitely doubled um, when through COVID, when they weren't allowed to go to Florida, then, you know, they started buying here more so than um, in Florida and other places. So those prices have definitely doubled on those, on those special properties like that. So I've made it, you know, a point to inform my sellers. I don't really know how to tell you the value of your home anymore. <laughs> um, because I mean, honestly, like homes I would list, I wouldn't think they would ever appraise and they would appraise for that or more once we got them under contract. So I'm just kind of been like, we'll see. Um, so I just tried to uh, let my sellers know that that could go either way. Um, you know, we've definitely been seeing an increase in prices as long as there's comparables. And I try to always, you know, make sure that there's comparables, but sometimes they're like, well, I want to get this much out of it. And then I'm not really thinking they will, but they did anyway. Um, so the appraisal process has been a little bit different. And for the most part, um, I don't think I really had any, I think I had like one or two out of several, I think, I don't remember how many transactions. I think I had 70 or something last year, but I had one or two that didn't appraise um, like it needed to. So that's not so bad, but, you know, just setting them up in case that doesn't happen. Um, let them know, hey, you know, this might not always be so smooth. We might not get exact, you know, just because you you want this and you get this on paper doesn't mean they're going to be able to get that much money. So, um, you know, you've seen a lot of things in recent in recent of the escalation clauses that they're going to pay like a portion of, you know, if it doesn't appraise, we've seen a lot more of those types of negotiating in the contract in the last year that we've never seen before. So um, those definitely, you know, gave your seller more peace of mind, but the appraisal process through the last year has definitely been a, we'll just see kind of thing, but just make mind, sure you always- Do you mind if I ask a qu question real quick? Yeah. Um, the, the two that, that you had that didn't appraise, yeah. what did you end up doing? Did you renegotiate the contract or what did you do? Um, I would have to think back specifically. Now, typically, I haven't had one just fall apart because of appraisal. Um, you know, if we get one, and now I we did have one, um, and it was actually an FHA, and I felt like the appraisal just came in. I had comps, and I tried to, you know, I sent those to the appraiser, was trying to support it, um, and then sent it back, you know, even sent them to the agent. I'm like, I think this is wrong. So it came in, I think about 20,000 below what we had it under contract for. And I felt like with that particular one that it was priced right. Um, so I kind of took a risk. Um, maybe not, I might not be telling you what I need to tell you, but I took a risk and you know, with FHA, typically those appraisals stick and they stick for like three months or so with it. So, you know, anytime you, if you were to get another FHA or VA uh, buyer, if you fall apart, then, you know, it's gonna go back to that appraisal. So you really can't get more than what it appraised for if an FHA appraisal sticks and, you know, that's what they submit. So I felt like with this particular property, we got it under contract in like 24 hours. It had multiple offers. I just went to my seller. I'm like, hey, I don't think you're going to have a problem 
getting this back under contract. And sure enough, and you know, their agent was telling me, oh, you're making a mistake. You know, you'll never get under contract. This is what it appraised for. It was an FHA appraisal. So sure enough, we put it back on the market. We got what we wanted out of it and it was a cash deal. So um, it worked out in the end, but not with that particular contract. So um, the other one, uh, most of the time, if I have one that doesn't appraise, and it's one of those that I wasn't so sure would appraise, I'll just go to my seller and I'll say, hey, look, you know, they wanted to give that, you wanted that, it's just not going to appraise, That's, you know, we can put it back on the market and try, but at the same time, you know, it might not, it might not work out, you're still going to have to appraise in the end unless you have a cash buyer, and most of the time, they're not crazy difference in price, sometimes it's like three or four thousand, sometimes it's six thousand, um, and we just renegotiate a lot of times. Because at that point, when you're that many days into it, a lot of times the sellers are already preparing to move. Maybe they found a home that they're, you know, wanting to purchase. And a lot of times they'll just go ahead and, and renegotiate with you. But any more questions? No? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I had any more maybe to speak on about that. No, I don't guess I have. Which, you know, I have had them not appraise and sellers stick to their guns and you know a lot of times in those situations um they may not ever get what they want but for the most part we get them worked out okay so this is um your seller timeline it's going to look quite a bit like the buyer timeline because it's the same thing right and i think this screen is kind of I'm trying, hang on i'm trying to get this uh mouse to work that doesn't work quite like my mouse okay there we go now you're up there um so <clears throat> what do you do once you get the contract accepted so as the listing agent you are going to mark your you know you're going to mark it pending on the mls if if well depends on your mls some mls's will have active under contract some will have all these different types of things. So depending on if, you're, if your seller wants to have their home to continue to be shown, um, then you would mark it active under contract or whatever your MLS allows you to do with that. Um, ours is active under contract. And that will allow that to still show active and allow people to know that, hey, we can still show that. Um, and be able to submit a backup offer. And sometimes, the active under contract means that it could be have for you know 48 hour first right of refusal on it. Um, which I don't know if you know what that means or not. That's you know, that would be where basically you have a contract on it, but it may be contingent upon that buyer selling their home and they would put it on the market. And if you were to get an, another acceptable offer then they would have 48 hours to release that contingency either by selling their home, maybe doing a bridge loan. Um, they may even be able to purchase, but didn't really want to uh, actually purchase two homes with a mortgage or get their home uh, pending. Or uh, I think I already said that, but, or they would just have to back away. And then at that point, the new offer would be able to be accepted. So um, a lot of times, if you see that active under contract or contingent on all those home sites, I don't like to say their names, um, then drop my phone um you can probably still show them so the next thing you're going to do you're going to uh, inform your seller of the inspection and that buyer's agent is going to send you that re repair request or whatever you're going to send that to your seller um schedule the appraisal send in that low appraisal response and review the closing statements and documents. So like today, um, I have a buyer that's actually got both sides of the deal, but my buyer is from out of state and um, he never, we closed it really quickly. I think it was in like 20 days, but we're closing tomorrow. And um, he never sent in his earnest money. I sent him his congrats letter. But for whatever reason, he just missed it and did not send it in. So I always, as the listing agent, uh, when I'm getting all my documents ready, um, I'll call the 
whoever at your office, I don't know who, Rachel, I think ours is Rachel. Um, I called her or messaged her and I was like, hey, do you have the earnest money for such and such property? And she was like, we don't got that one. So I was like, oh shoot, because this is why it's important. You wanna review those documents in that closing disclosure, make sure your price is the new price if you've negotiated. Um, you wanna make sure you're getting paid and that commission that's on there is what your seller agreed to pay you because I've had it before where agents will send in that it's this much percentage and then it not be what your seller had actually agreed to pay. So then you're like, no, nope, that's not right. So make sure your commission's correct. If you have a transaction fee, make sure your transaction fees on there because you don't want to be paying that to your office and make sure that, um, termite, home warranties are all on there. Anything that was negotiated in that contract, go through that closing disclosure with a fine tooth comb and make sure that everything is there. Cl uh, closing costs that were agreed to be paid by the seller for on behalf of the buyer, you know, check all that out. <clears throat> but most importantly, if you have an earnest money, make sure that you have it in your office because I know sometimes, you know, we don't get informed if they're mailed in and so um, I've had to eat a couple of those in the past and I've learned the hard way that I better check before we close. Otherwise I'm paying it and that's never a good thing. So um, okay. any questions on any of that? Nope. Okay. I think a lot of this, um, Okay, some of this isn't so repetitive, but some of it is. So communication of your deadlines is important. So um, sometimes, you know, a certain deadline might mean that you have a repair request and you've negotiated for your seller to, you know, do some repairs. So typically those repairs are due to be done two or three days prior to closing. Um, this day and time, it's almost impossible to get anybody to do anything. So, um, you know, it's important that it gets done in a timely manner. Um, that way the contract can still close. I've had them to even close, you know, with the repairs to survive closing. That's usually a disaster, like windows. You know, windows are impossible to get. So, you know, one of the things I had was actually a window uh sash i don't even know what that is but it was something so we had a window sash that was supposed to be put into a home that one of my buyers bought a year and a half ago and this particular window whatever it was um was out like six months we negotiated that that survived closing everybody agreed on that and six months later it comes in and it's the wrong thing and then now here we go again so it was like a year later before the guy got it. Um, so it's ideally you want to do everything and get everything taken care of and done prior to closing. But with the way things are right now, sometimes, you know, that can't be done. I know concrete is almost impossible to get right now as well. Windows, concrete, um, all that, all that good stuff. So uh, another thing also, um, that I've learned, you know, as far as like communication with your sellers, make sure that um, they, um, you know, if they're going to hire a moving company, that they can get that scheduled probably by right around or after the uh, inspection time. If they have to cancel it for whatever reason, if the appraisal doesn't go through, then, you know, they can cancel that, but I typically like for them to wait at least until after the inspection because it can go one way or the other at that point. If the buyer just wants to say, oh, I don't know what I was thinking that day. I'm gone. Um, you know, they can do that. <laughs> I always tell them to wait until we get through inspections. Then if they need to go ahead and hire their movers, they can do that. And um, cleaners. So one thing, you know, in our contract, it just says it's supposed to be broom clean. However, um, something that I've done in the past is I've actually offered cleaning after my clients move. Um, and it's kind of like my little, don't worry about cleaning. We'll have them come in and clean it for you. Kind of just a little gift and a thank you to them for letting me be their awesome agent. Um, 
and that's always went over really well but just make sure they know not to leave their garbage um they go piles of burn metal piles in the back that they burnt the couch or whatever they did make sure all that's gone um actually had somebody that buried a car in the backyard one time it's not good <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't really know what happened with that, but they found out later they had buried this big metal car in the backyard. But anyway, um, you know, it, it's never good to move in your home and you have to deal with somebody else's garbage. And, uh, you know, that usually does not go over well as far as how that buyer feels about your seller and you want it to be a nice, happy, joyous uh, moment for everybody. So. Um, sending the contract to the title company. We talked about that a couple of times. Okay, let's move on. Pretty much the same thing as before. Um, you know, you're going to ask your seller the same thing as far as how they want to communicate and get everything. And this is the exact same thing I just showed you. Pretty sure. Yep, it is. Okay. Okay, so this is going to talk a little bit about opportunities and command. Um, I used to be a tech trainer prior to command, <laughs> and I'm not now because, I mean, I know command well enough to get to do it, but at the same time, I'm not the command guru. Um, so it's great what our company does offer us. Um, prior to this, I think I had about five or six different things that I paid for or you know I think I had lines desk and I had like you know google sheets I had all this stuff where now we can all put it into this and it's so much easier and it's great but um you know so this command can definitely um help you work through the contract to close uh, part of the transaction um, you can set up reminders, you can set up, you know, your little bullet things that I told you are in my brain that I don't write down. Um, you can put all that in there. It will even send out emails to your people and let them know what's going on. So it's amazing. I wish I knew more about it, <laughs> but I don't know everything about it. Um, so, but anyway, it uh, definitely has changed things for me because now everything's in one spot for me to keep up with where before it was everywhere so i still keep my google uh sheet thing just because I, I like it and i can view it on my phone easily and all that but yeah any ahas from get from today no no okay uh, okay, best practices in risk avoidance. Do I need to take a break? Am I supposed to take breaks? <laughs> Does anybody need to take a break? Let's take a 10 minute break and come back at two. How about that? Then we'll start at this. Does that work for everybody? Anybody use the bathroom? Okay. I don't know how many, how long we're supposed to take a break for, but.
Now you have to like remind you to see that. Got about another minute left. Um, for those of you that did not catch my introduction earlier, um, I'm Ashley Pierce. Used to be Ashley Hogan, um, and I'm from Central Kentucky. I'm an in independent agent here. I'm not on a team or anything. Um, and right here in Central Kentucky, I work a very small rural market. It's kind of a unique market because we live near two um, recreational lakes so I sell a lot of vacation properties and um, lake homes but then I also sell a lot of farms a lot of a lot of hunting properties as well as single family residences so one thing I don't do is commercial I'm just not gonna dabble in that but. hey Ashley I was wondering yes. um are you able to email like your, I love your idea, the congrats letter, um, just like a generic copy mm -hmm. of that, um, or even your 10 yeah. commandments letter, that kind of thing. Do you mean if I type yeah. my email, maybe in the messages, that'd be great. Yeah. If you want to, um, or I can give you guys my email as well. I don't know if I can put that in the messages real quick. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Where is that? Where are the messages? I think the chat. There at the bottom, maybe. Um, okay, I, I don't even really know how to do this, honestly. That is not right. I might have been missing like all kinds of messages. Um, all right, well, maybe if I know. Well, I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm gonna break it if I keep going here probably. So if you all want to um, take my email, if you want a copy of my congrats letter or um, my, uh, I, I have a couple things that I, I use for this part of my transactions, kind of like what I expect for my sellers and I have one for buyers, what I expect for my buyers. Um, you know, and that kind of helps me to bulletproof this part of the deal. 
Um, I'd be happy to send it to you. I can send you kind of my little thing that I send everybody that has my lenders, my insurance companies, title companies, all that, that I give, send along with as a PDF um, to my buyers whenever they're, they get under contract. And um, also my 10 commandments for buying home. So, um, but my email is actually Ashley, A-S-H-L-I-E, real estate at gmail.com. So if you need me to repeat that, I'd be happy to, but I spell my name wrong, apparently. A-S-H-L-I-E, real estate at gmail.com. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started back again. Um, I think we've already talked about this part here, about command, we've asked for ahas. Okay, so I think we're gonna go into best practices and risk avoidance. I got to move you guys, I moved you trying to figure out where the chat bubble was. <clears throat> okay, this is all pretty self-explanatory. Communicate clearly with, with everyone, with and often with everyone involved, um, you know, set the expectations up front. That's that letter, like what I expect from you as my seller, what I expect from you as my buyer. Maintain your professionalism throughout the whole thing. Um, don't get cranky and go off the deep end and, you know, in a text message like the wild Kermit the frog, you know, or anything like that when somebody makes you angry because I promise you it'll happen. Um, the other thing as well is, you know, try to keep everything in a template um that way when you send it it's kind of like looks good professional and you kind of have your little thing going there that works for you okay let's keep going um, really having a problem with this okay so this is this is something too um i try to look at any time that i have a contract so if I feel like there might be a problem, I try to go ahead and I'll tell my people right away that I think it might be a problem. So an example, one that I just had, this was for the seller side. I sold a property with 10 and a half acres that was auctioned off and there were multiple other lots before you got to this home that had never been built on. So basically what happened was there was a road going through there. This home was in the back. And my buyer for that home was getting a VA loan. So I don't know if you all have ever dealt with this before, but um, if a home is not considered a county road or something that's publicly maintained by your county or through an HOA, then there has to be what's called a, um, like a maintenance agreement for that road between all parties. And he didn't know if there was one or not because he bought it. And so, you know, something that I seen coming, knowing it was a VA loan, seeing the road, I let him know ahead of time, hey, you may want to check on this. If, you know, look at your plat, see if it was an actual, if there's any kind of maintenance agreement. And sure enough, there was. So if there, if we hadn't have done that before the final underwriting, then, you know, odd enough, my buyers were moving from Mississippi they had scheduled their movers, everything was going great. And so that's how it usually goes. Everything's going great, then wham, you get hit. And that was one of those things that I've been hit with before was that underwriter saying, where is the road maintenance agreement? So, you know, he had that, he was ready to rock and roll. We sent all that in and no issues. So that was something in the past, you know, if there wasn't a road maintenance agreement, then those, those have fell apart. And then, you know, if you can't get all the, landowners to agree because they don't want to pay any money you know then you won't get one and so a VA loan or any kind of secondary market loan like that a lot of times you'll have trouble getting financing on those okay okay referrals and reviews those are always a good thing um a lot of my business is was built on referral, word of mouth. Um, I was working in a very small community. And when I left that small mom and pop company, I went to Keller Williams in Louisville, Louisville East actually. Um, we didn't have Keller Williams in this part of the state yet. So I wanted, I wanted to work for Keller Williams, but I had to work out of Louisville because, which was an hour and a half from my home. 
because that was the only one that was really close to me that I could really work at. So anyway, um, I was kind of known to them as the lake person. I sold at the lake. So that's really helped boost my career. Um, you know, those agents have referred me multiple, multiple um, sellers, multiple buyers, um, you know, doing a really good job for agents as well as as your buyers and your sellers is going to is going to help you. So referrals aren't just, um, you know, going to be you do a good job for your buyer, your buyers going to send you people. It's also what you do with other agents as well. So if you do a good job, and they know you're going to take care of their people. They're going to keep sending you buyers and sellers. Um, your reviews are always good. Can't satisfy everybody. And, you know, the ones that are going to review you are usually the angry ones that want to sabotage your career. Um, so it's always good to make it an F, to make an effort to send out and ask for those reviews, usually prior to closing. Um, do it while they're happy. <laughs> Um, because a lot of times, you know, you want everybody to be happy in the end, but it, you know, when they get to moving and they're angry and, you know, something didn't go right and they, they're, it's 120 degrees outside and they're having to move this weekend or it's snowing and, you know, it's just not a great time to say, how'd I do for you? You know, <laughs> um, go ahead and ask for that. Probably prior to closing, I would say like right after appraisal and everybody knows we're closing, we're going to, you know, you've done a good job. We're clear to close. Send and ask for that review then. Um, not afterwards when things get messy. Hopefully they don't get messy, but they tend to sometimes. It's just not a good. And I've noticed a lot of times after closing, a lot of times your people won't even respond to you sometimes. So it's better to do that before because they think you're going to you're gonna ask them something else whenever you're calling or sending that email. Okay. Oh, and I guess it's going to go into that. I probably should quit. There we go. Oh, look, it's going over everything I said. Repeat business referrals. Those are, I get a lot of those. I have some people I've sold homes for five or six times, I feel like. Um, referral business, your client reviews, all of that is um, future opportunity and great. It's a lot better than a billboard or buying Zillow ads. Buying Zillow, <laughs> promise you. Get, um, you can ask at every conversation. So one thing I do is anytime that I'm, I'm out and about or I see somebody or I'm calling somebody on the phone or you know we're reaching the closing or, or whatever, or I'm inviting them to an event, I'm going to, I'm going to ask them for a referral. Hey, you know, anybody that's looking to buy or sell right now, it never hurts to ask and, you know, keep that top of mind all the time to them. Um, throughout the transaction with the buyer or seller and at closing, Hey, everybody's happy. I did a great job. You know, anybody else wanting to sell? It's always a good time to ask them too. <clears throat> okay. This is, I think that's the same one I just seen. Any ahas about that? I hope I said everything I needed to say, but I feel like I kind of flew through it. Okay, post-closing and follow-up. Am I going too fast? I think I, feel, I think I went through a lot of the main parts of this and now I'm going to the end. Okay, so um, post-closing follow-up. So before we had smart plans, I, I used to use Lion's Desk. Um, this that we have now in command is, is a great way to, you know, build a smart a plan for somebody post-closing or, you know, even somebody that's going to be thinking about buying or selling. So this um, is a way for you to do those touches and, and keep up with everybody. Like, um, let's see here. Going. Okay, this is what I was mentioning earlier about building um, your business with, with uh, on your downline and your co-agent relationships. That's kind of what I did when I worked in Louisville. Um, I also was with the Kentucky Real Estate Association's um, leadership at the state level. So all those networking events and all that, I just kind of like, even on my card, it says, you're Nolan Lake referral agent on my card, because a lot of my cards go to more agents than they did you know, um, 
buyers and sellers. So I wanted people to kind of associate me with the lake and they did, and they don't want to work it because they didn't, it was out of their realm and they weren't comfortable. So they were sure to um, send them to me. And it's just always good that you do a great job because those, those agents are going to refer you to more agents as well. I feel like it's going really fast now. You think it's going really fast now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm going too fast. I think you're good. You don't have to stretch out. Okay, well, you know, maybe we'll get done early and then if I can think of anything else, I'll just make sure that I get you guys all the materials um, that I have that I sent to everybody. But um, okay, ahas to achievement. How has your thinking changed and what ideas or mindsets were new? What do you feel differently about? Okay. Those are just some things to think about like for your ahas to write down. Make sure you're writing those down, what you learned today. Okay. So this is just your little checklist to um, your daily success, your 10 conversations, add 10 contacts, 10 handwritten notes, and all those things that uh, you need to do. Okay, a quote. I engage every conversation in spirit of contribution and people are happy to be in a relationship with me. Is that the end? Oh, now you're supposed to role play for 20 minutes. I don't know how to do that. I'm going to, I'm just going to flip through here. If they might fire me. Oh, and they will allow me to do this again. Okay. Oh, what was that? in this computer are going to fight. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm the second to last class for Ignite. Um, so I think, you know, your next one's going to be plan your future. I hope I didn't forget anything um, or leave anything out today for this. And if you guys have any questions at this point, feel free to ask anything you wish. Um, Pick my brain, whatever you would like to do. And I, because I still have quite a bit of time left, apparently, but we didn't role play and all that. And I don't think I want to role play with myself. And I don't know if you want to role play with yourself. I only see one person in here at this point. So. <laughs> do you have any more questions? No, I think I'm all set. I'm going to email you um, to get the those things that you have there. Perfect. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So I'm going to. Uh, let me see if I can find, do you know how to do this where I can show the chat, like put my email? Um, maybe if you press escape, it might take you out of that. Okay. And then I don't really know how to get to the chat. Oh, here's the chat. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll type, I'm going to type my email in the chat here. So you have it. Um, and feel free to email me if you would like a copy of my materials. And my name is Ashley Pierce. In case you're wondering, I used to be Ashley Hogan. A lot of people still know me by that. They think I'm a different person and I got married, but I didn't. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Well, I've enjoyed um, doing this for you guys today. Sorry, I feel like I've, I don't know, maybe all those role play things and stuff, I, I've kind of skipped out, but I hope you learned something. Um, anytime you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I love to share my experiences and, um, you know, I feel like I've learned everything the hard way. So I probably have a good story for about anything um, in my, I think, eight years now that I've been in real estate. So um, anyway, you guys have a good day. I'll see you soon. And I Thanks, don't know Ashley. how to get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Am I done? Uh, thank you for asking.